I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Elif Batuman, I have been waiting to talk to you. I loved The Idiot. I'm not the only person who loved it. It was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And now Either Or, the sequel, is out in paperback. And this just feels like a really cool moment for the book. Because also I've been reading, uh, rereading, I should say, by listening to your audiobooks. And you read them. They're so good. They're so good. Thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I could not be more excited. So I have a question for you, though. Listening to you read both books, both The Idiot and Either Or, does it change your relationship with Celine? Does it change your relationship with your own work when you have to read it out loud over the course of, what, a week per book? Yes, it's, uh, it's I think it was three or four days, and it's all day in the studio, and you have a director. And actually, um, with The Idiot, there was... I wouldn't say pushback, but it was made very clear to me that they prefer for nonfiction books to be read by the author and fiction books to be read by an actor. Mm -hmm. And the director also, like a big part of his kind of like personality was how much it was like how he thinks actors are better at reading books than authors. And he's like written a lot of essays about it that I read online. And it was, Mm. and the, the reason for that is that um, he's like, the words don't matter. And this is something that he said frequently, like I would come in and he'd be like, cause you know what, Ailey, the words don't matter because words aren't, uh, actable, but emotions are actable. So the words really don't matter. And I was like, it's just an interesting thing to say to the rest. <laughs> I was like, cool, cool. Dude, what? I never took drama in school. You always have to choose between like drawing and acting. And right. I feel self-conscious not writing in the first person. I feel self-conscious pretending to be someone I'm not. I feel self-conscious about acting. So I thought, yeah, let's go with an actor. And then uh, they sent some sample clips. And, mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't know how, I don't how much audiobook you, I started consuming audiobooks during the pandemic. And the, yeah. especially the ones that are in America have like a very particular style. Different readers are different. And I think that the general style works better for certain books than for other books. But there was a kind of like wry over it quality that was mm-hmm. like instead of being like you know the chair was pushed up against the wallpaper which was faded it would be like the chair was pushed up against the wallpaper which was faded and it also all of the clips that they sent me all had people reading it was all kind of like white sounding people for want of a better reading about stuff that was like from another country I had a bowl of chewy kita kind of noodle <laughs> I just thought, I don't, you know, I don't want this person, like, that's not the sensibility. And I know actors and they can do different stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So then I went there and um, the first person stuff, I mean, there was a challenge, which was um, the director gave me actually a lot of really helpful pictures, but within, you know, it was kind of a matter of constantly, you couldn't just be like, okay, I'm just going to listen to what this person says because like, 30% 30% of the stuff that he said just sounded crazy to me. It was like, okay. The parts that were first person were, mm-hmm. were, were relatively easy to do. Yeah. Um, I did have a, a lot more trouble with the dialogue, including the sitting dialogue and especially the dialogue for other people. Uh-huh. It did really change. There's a scene at the end of the idiot where not to give too much away, but there's right. like a, conversation between two characters who don't really talk for the whole book so it's this kind of like it's great (laughs) it's a great great section that's all I'm gonna say but it's great it's based on an actual relationship that I had and you know when I was 18 that I and you know when you live things you have a a a story that you tell about it you don't necessarily revisit it or change it as you get older and uh definitely reading it out loud and with a director Mm -hmm. and the other characters the uh a guy so, and the director was a man. So he was much more in tune with like what the man would have been thinking. And I actually found that mind blowing because I hadn't, I realized that I hadn't been thinking about like, why was he thinking? Why was he saying those things? Yeah. That actually felt really cool to read out loud. Cause one of the things I really love about both books on audio and the way you read them is that it feels so sort of perfectly deadpan and organic to what you're doing in the novels. And I mean, you got me to read Kierkegaard. (laughs) I know you read either or as a sophomore in college. And all I can think is, you know, I would like to talk to sophomore you because we're going to get to the influences. Obviously, some of this is you, but these are novels. These are novels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But Kierkegaard, (laughs) I'm sorry, my eyes are getting big just thinking about it. I just I love the delivery. And the delivery to me just keeps me seated in the story in a way, as if I was reading it 
on my own on the page kind of thing. And I, I, I don't like being taken out of the story when I'm in something that deep, especially something that's making me squirm a little bit. Mm. I remember being 18, 19, 20. <laughs> Not my finest moments. Um, <laughs> depending what you consider fine, I'm depending our scale of fineness. Um, okay, let me rephrase that. I have some memories that feeling emotions deeply. Yeah, yeah. it's our finest moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I have a lot of compassion for who I was at that age. Let's put it that way. But at the same time, it's like, ooh, do I, do I really want to remember? That? Yeah, <laughs> do yeah. I really want to? But I love Celine as a character. And I like her honesty. I like her sort of directness. I like the fact that she's very earnest. Very honest. All of these things where she's just, she's, to me, she's a really refreshing new kind of character. Because I don't think we always give this kind of coming of age story the room to roam. Because you're playing in two sort of sections, right? You've got this whole... Like, how does the life of the mind work and how are all of these influences creating this character? And then you've got this 18 year old who I guess she gets to 20 in either or. Right. Yes. Okay. So between the ages of 18 and 20, we meet this young woman who. I mean, there's a lot of change and a lot of growing and she's just she's so wry. And I don't know if she always knows she's funny. Yeah. Yeah. The literalness and the deadpanness. Mm-hmm. I guess what one thing I'm interested in is like how why are things the way that they are? I think this is something that novels are really well equipped to do. That's like one thing that really attracts me to to mm-hmm. novel writing is to question what why are structures the way that they are? Why are the yeah. things that we don't question? Like maybe in the part about alcohol where she's mm-hmm. like, why do people drink at parties. And then she's like, oh, I understand why people drink at parties. People drink at parties because other people are insufferable and you have to poison your body <laughs> to numb yourself. And it's kind of like, does she know that's funny? Like, she kind of knows it's funny, but she's also kind of really trying to truthfully describe everything. Yeah. I would say she's a very kind of literal person. And in that sense, I think it's also like a like a kind of a device that novels do. Like, Don Quixote is someone who takes everything super literally yep. with comic results. And I think that there's some, um, like, she's reading Kierkegaard, who's really saying some kind of bonkers stuff. And if you want to, you know, really read those books as works of philosophy, you have to extend a lot of like you know take a lot of things metaphorically and she's really just taking everything as a literal instruction which I find really refreshing because I think that there's we sort of tend to say like oh everyone knows that you should take this metaphorically everyone knows you're not supposed to take this literally but then you know we go around with with all these ideas that we should already know things that are never actually stated. So and that was one of the things that I wanted to question and kind of push. Which I love because the other thing is too, and you said it when about the assumption, right? That we should know, we should know, we should know. And it's like, actually, I, your brain doesn't finish cooking until it's 25. Like we actually have the science that says yeah, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> your brain continues to develop and change until the age of 25. So this idea that Somehow we're, you know, tiny adults as we get thrown into college. And I'm just thinking, oh, right. There's that. Yeah, and you're supposed to know every like everything just changes all of a sudden. And mm-hmm. also you've been like working and working to like get into college and then you get there and you think everything's over and then but everything has only just begun. Also, I feel like one of the big obstacles that I'm always thinking of and that I think I, I would like to think about eroding is just shame culture and how much yes. of shame culture works by people being like, everyone knows you don't do that. Everyone knows you do this. Everyone knows nobody does that. And the thing that nobody does is actually something everything does, but nobody talks about. Right. So um, yeah, I feel like the literalness is a way to combat that too. I just really love her voice. And I'm wondering, you have talked about the fact that you had sort of a start to the idiot you put it in a drawer and you came back to it like 15 years later. Yes. And that you needed that distance. And then on top of it, I read, well, either or was maybe going to be an essay collection, not a novel. (laughs) And it sort of comes directly out of the experience of publishing The Idiot, which, I mean, so many of us were like raving about this. But when, when The Idiot first came out, it just, it was so refreshing and it was so fun and slightly weird in a good way. But we almost didn't get either or, and it's a pretty direct sequel. So I'm wondering if you would tell that story about how we got here, because it's pretty great. Oh, yeah. I always wanted to be a writer. And in college, I had this kind of crazy experience with this um, guy who's like the character Yvonne. And mm-hmm. I always wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't like, I could tell I wasn't good enough at it. So like, 
make a living. Uh, so I went to grad school. I found out that they pay you to get a PhD, mm -hmm. uh, to, that they, you know, you do some teaching and basically uh -huh. reading books and you get a stipend and you get housing. So I did that. And then I, I thought I'll write a novel on the side. And then that turned out to not be possible. You couldn't do anything on the side because you were busy with all the reading books and, and teaching classes and stuff. So I took a year off and I tried to write this book about this thing that happened to me in my freshman year of college. So at that point I was like 23 and I was writing about being 18. And I wrote and I wrote and it's like the thing that I produced was like five times longer than the idiot, which is not, it's not hugely long, but it's not especially short. And then I, I couldn't figure out how to finish it and I broke my arm and I didn't have health insurance. So I went back to grad school and had excellent health insurance and did this, you know, PhD in Russian literature and comparative literature. And then from that, I ended up becoming a nonfiction writer, which was somehow, I think it had a lot to do with how fiction and nonfiction was positioned at this really specific time, like between 2000 yeah. and 2011, which yeah. like the auto fiction happened and it completely changed again. But um, so I became a nonfiction writer. Then I was living in Turkey and I was writing for The New Yorker. And I decided I wanted to write a, a novel about a New Yorker writer who's in Turkey writing these magazine articles who realizes that everything in the magazine articles is like kind of a lie because it's not actually about like the whole like human integrity of life. It's just about these kind of like packaged magazine subjects. I got a contract to write that novel and it turned out to be impossible to write because it was basically just about the life that I was living then. Okay. Um, and then I ended up having to spend a bunch of the advance for unrelated stuff. And, and then I was just in this very difficult position and, and I started writing flashbacks to that novel about like, how, how did this New Yorker writer get in this situation? And her love life was a mess. And then it was like, she was thinking about how her love life was also a mess when she was in, in college. And then I was like, wait, didn't I write a whole novel about this? I was at a residency, this wonderful residency, Santa Maddalena. It's the one in Italy where you stay yeah. at Vanessa's house and there's like pugs everywhere. There was something about being there. Uh, I, I was super, super depressed. Oh, then I went into therapy for the first time. And then a year into therapy, I suddenly got like this, someone canceled at Santa Maddalena. And I went at the last minute and I was just surrounded by all of these pugs and, and stuff. And then I was able to go into the cloud and read this old novel that I'd written yeah. Go. And then I realized the book I was trying to write was called The Two Lives. And I came across a sentence in the, the abandoned book that was like, I began to feel I was living two lives. One consisted of my normal life and the other consisted of these emails I was writing with this guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so it was always the two life. Anyway, so I realized that was the book I, I had to write first. So I wrote that book and then I thought I was done with college and I was finished. Then I went on book tour and it was like, right at the beginning of the Trump presidency, it was like early 2017. And that year me too happened. And it was like all, I was doing the promotion and all of the media people were just like completely shell shocked by Trump. And a lot of the conversations were about kind of like the Muslim ban and, and mm -hmm. just like kind of political stuff that wasn't really that closely related to the content of the book. And it made me think a lot about, and, and there was some pushback about the book not being political enough. Particularly, there were these two kind of incidents that I had. One was in Berkeley and one was in um, Italy in, in Monte mm -hmm. Book Festival, where um, these kind of older men uh, really publicly took me to task for, um, there's one passage in The Idiot where Celia and the main, the narrator reads a newspaper. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that the newspaper that she, article that she reads is about the artificial insemination of a elephant in the Berlin Zoo named Kika, and they fly the sperm there in a cooler. And she's like, huh. So that's what's in the news. And both of these guys were like, were you, was this a commentary on how oblivious people is? There's no political consciousness in these books. Like there's so much going on in the world between 1995 and 96 and all this like idiot can see is, you know, the elephant insemination. And then, you know, the more I was talking about the book and talking to readers and people who liked the book and people who didn't like the book, the more I understood that it was a book about depoliticization. It was a mm -hmm. book. About, and I, you know, there were specific scenes in it. Like there's a scene where Sidin decides, um, learns that some people at, at Harvard major in government and that such people exist and they're called gov jocks. And she's like, well, so are people like that going to be our rulers? And it's kind of a throwaway line. But then the Kavanaugh hearing happened while I was still promoting the idiot. And I was like, no, those people are our rulers. You know, like there's Kavanaugh being like, I was the captain of the whatever team. And so, you know, like it, it, it was so clear at the time that the idiot came out. I was very early in uh, my first lesbian relationship with my 
partner with whom I now hope to spend the rest of my life. And I, I was just living my best life and with this new queer consciousness that I didn't know that I had. And I was thinking a lot about like, well, why didn't I do this earlier? And then Me Too happened. And I think a lot of women my age were thinking back about um, our early sexual history and retelling it using language that we didn't, you know, as someone who was a teen and and 20 year old in in the the 90s, I didn't think of the word rape culture as or patriarchy. Like, I think I knew about them, but I don't think I thought that they applied to me. I just don't remember them taking Mm -hmm. And then if it's like vocabulary that you didn't necessarily have or didn't use, it's hard to go back in time and remember how you thought about it. So in the process of promoting the idiot and talking about the idiot and thinking about my own early sexual history and about, you know, the year in my life after the events of the idiot, I realized that I had to write another book and that it had to be set in that time. I had to go back there. I did not really plan to write another book about her next year in college, but that's how it happened. It's really great. Thank you. It's really great. Because here's the thing. If you go back and you think about 95, 96, 97, yeah. which is the period that the two books cover together, email is brand new and it's not like the interface we use now. Like you're actually having to type like little bits of code, which makes me laugh because uh, shenanigans yeah. ensue because our friend Celine um, types like I do. And <laughs> occasionally stuff goes in different directions and, you know, things happen. But we also didn't have, as you said, language for things like if you think about how quickly language has changed in the last 20 some odd years right yeah. it's wild it in is the last five years yeah it's wild it's totally right. wild yeah. so the idea that you're getting sort of guff from people saying they're not political i mean i could argue and i will argue that Actually, that is a political statement in and of itself that she is not a political. It represents the time. It represents this moment in the 90s when, like, we were all kind of barbarians. I mean, honestly, like, men, women, non, everyone was a barbarian because we just didn't have the awareness that we have now. And this is part of what culture and art and societies we're supposed to evolve. <laughs> like that. We're supposed to keep moving forward, right? Yeah, exactly. And Celine, I just, I really, I'm so fond of her because she's just looking at everyone going, really? Mm-hmm. Really? There's a lot of that sort of, and the idea that she keeps turning to books, mm-hmm. right? At one moment, like Henry James pops up and she's having this moment with Isabel Archer from Portrait of a Lady. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And it totally works. And I love it. I go back and forth on Henry James because, as I mentioned, I'm, you know, I, mm, there's some stuff that I've read and there's some stuff where I'm like, I get it and I appreciate it, but this is not the thing that makes my heart go pitter patter. But I love the idea that this kid who's just so focused on trying to figure out how to live and how to be a person and how to be a writer, like she wants to write too. And yep, there's Henry James. You know, there's Proust. Yeah, yeah. There's, I just, I love the way you bring in all of these sort of, well, classic ideas. Because mm-hmm. that, to me, like, the contrast between her life of the mind, right? And, like, what the reality of her day-to-day is, mm-hmm. that is a political statement. Mm-hmm. So, I'm just calling guff on the people who were giving you a hard time. Oh, thank you. Garbage. I mean, I had those ideas too. Like, I think that what you said is it took me a long time to recognize what you just said, which is that that like the depoliticization is itself political. And I think in the 90s, I was really conscious of choosing like that there were literature people and politics people and I'm a literature person. And it really wasn't until 2016, 2017 that I started reading second wave feminism for the first mm-hmm. time, really understood what they meant by the personal is political. And a lot of those writers like Shulamith Firestone and, and a lot of the second wave feminists, um, Adrian Rich, are talking about ways that great literature has depoliticized and romanticized life and specifically has depoliticized women. And that was something that I really became conscious of mm-hmm. during the Kavanaugh hearing when I just yep. thought about how Christine Blasey Ford, like she's clearly such a smart, thoughtful person and who wrote this PhD dissertation on childhood trauma. And she's thought about all these things, but she went into psychology, you know, and Kavanaugh went into politics and it's Mm -hmm. like, I went into literature and this is how, like, these are the people who go into all these different things. So I'm also one of those people though, who thinks that art is political. It is, it is, it is. And also whose story gets told through art, like that's political. Like there are people who can say, 
Well, you know, I don't want politics in my movies. I don't want politics in my books. I don't want it in my poetry, whatever. They brewed during the Cold War and, you know, we drank it to some extent. And it's one of the things that I'm really excited about the changes in language and everything of the past few years is the extent to which it's become part of common awareness, the extent to which um, like personal life and individual decisions are actually interfacing with world historical movements in some way, which I feel like was not when I was a kid. And when I was growing up, those things were like not viewed as, as continuous. And now they mm-hmm. are. that's a, that's a realization that art was onto how important childhood trauma was. Like, you know, I remember reading novels for the first time in high school and being like, well, why do I have to read like three chapters at the beginning about the gra- grandparents' childhood? Mm-hmm. Because that's actually the most important, you know, it's epigenetics and trauma and um, and that's how all these things feed into to making the world the way that it is. Yeah, so I agree with you completely. Art is political. You reference Anna Karenina and Eugene on again quite a lot. A lot, a lot, yeah. or. And, you know, when I was younger, I had a really different relationship with Anna Karenina and also, honestly, Madame Bovary. And, you know, you, Bovary surfaces a little bit too, but not quite to the level that Anna Karenina does. And you know, like my relationship with those books have changed over time as and those characters too. I used to be yeah. a little snotty about both of those women because I was like, well, why would those are just what? Those are bad joy. Ah, you know, that sort of judgment that you have when you're younger and you quite don't have the full picture, but you really think you do because um, yeah. you have that sort of arrogance of youth. And I love the idea that it was Eugene Onegin and Anna Karenina that made you think, oh, I can do this. Like <laughs> you read them at a really young age and we get these sort of very complex idea-driven novels with a great character at their heart. Like we don't always get that as much as I would like in fiction. Yeah, that's true. Um I think I had a similar response to Madame Bovary. I was just kind of like, why do I want to read about this kind of icky, depressing person, which I now blame Flaubert for. I find Anna Karenina much more kind of humane. And Anna actually reminded me a lot of my mom. Um, mm-hmm. who, my mom left my dad and there was another guy involved. And it was, and I, and I heard people say the same kind of like poisonous stuff about her that the characters say about Anna Karenina. So I was very kind of like, there's a way that, reading Anna Karenina when I was a teenager in high school, it it felt like it was describing the same kind of complicated situations that right. I found myself in. And describing how angry people get with each other and giving all the reasons when you're reading it, you feel that anger too. And then he right. does he goes to the other person and you see it from their point of view. I just found it very like soothing and I don't know, not even like, oh, I could do this, but I want to do this. Like this is the way that I'm going to have some kind of mastery over I'm going to not be a ping pong ball in my own life I'm going to be you know be able to to turn it into a rich meaningful story like that's that was kind of my dream and then with Eugene and Egan I think that it kind of goes back to what you were saying before which is the interface between books and real life like the narration of Eugene and Egan is so chatty and so like there's so much quotation and so much thinking about books and there's a real acknowledgement of I mean I think this is a problem that I had when I wanted to be a novelist um, earlier, and I kind of mm-hmm. ended up a nonfiction writer. I was told sometimes that things that I wrote that I thought of as fiction, like I would submit them to be edited. And and three or four times, I had the experience of people being like, "Well, we can publish this, but as nonfiction, but it's because it's clearly an essay." And I think that the problem I was having was wanting to write about, you know, to really nerd out on books and read because I think of it all as being the same texture. You know, like if you're if you're a reader you're always reading something or you're often reading something and it's always kind of going in the back of your mind and you're going in and out of it and you're going in and out of your real life. And there are kind of these two tracks that are always playing and they're always informing each other. And like, that's what I want to read about is like, that's how, that's the kind of total picture. Your very first, first book, The Possessed, you wanted to write that as a novel about a graduate student at Stanford studying yeah. Russian lit. And it was actually published as an essay collection. And it's a really terrific essay collection. And if you're looking to dip in to sort of Russian literature in a way that is not incredibly intimidating, highly recommend it. I mean, it's also very funny. And I think people assume that like the Russians are just not funny. Like it's just a mountain to be climbed kind of thing. It's like Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of pages. And I'm like, well, actually. But this idea that you have laid out and and you've done it in a number of places where you were comparing War and Peace to something else, some other epic novel. And you're like, 
So the only thing they have in common is the fact that stuff is made up. That's like not enough. No, well, yeah, because Put them I, on the same continuum. And what yeah. was the other book? Sorry, it was a really good. It was probably in search of lost time or something. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I Sorry. was just thinking about how, like, because um, I studied theory of the novel in grad school, and people get yeah. really technical, and there's there's no working theory of the novel. Like, there's no rule that you can make up that immediately tells you what is a novel and what isn't a novel and why that everyone can agree on. And yet, that's kind of in the in the world of theory. But uh-huh. in the world of, like selling books, there's this idea that there's fiction and nonfiction and novels right. and fiction and novels and fiction are kind of the same thing. And it just seems crazy to me to think of like, yeah, if you think of War and Peace and Search of Lost Time, Don Quixote and like Moby Dick and Robinson Crusoe, you know, all of which have huge nonfiction components in them. And if you think like those, what those things have in common is that the most important thing that they share is that they're not true. It just doesn't it make sense just to say that. Yeah. Elena Ferrante also has a little bit of a hand in the creation of either or. And I really love this part of the story too, because you were reading her. And again, you're thinking about nonfiction versus fiction and all of these big, and you're coming off of this tour for the idiot. Yeah. And you're reading the third volume in the Neapolitan series. And you're like, Hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. I I love this connection. I really, I think it's very cool. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah. Oh, I love the Neapolitan novels so much. And yeah, at the beginning of the third novel, Elena, the narrator is promoting an autobiographical novel that she wrote about um, this unpleasant sexual infatuation encounter that happened um, with her crush Nino. And she basically ends up raped by Nino's father, though she doesn't use that word. And she writes this book about it. By the time the book comes out, it's 1968 and it's the middle of the student protests and all of Elena's friends are, they're communists and they're protesting in the student movement and they're doing all this stuff. And and she can tell that like her friends, they're supportive of her book and they're like, you know, well done, brava. But she can tell that they're a little bit not enthused. And finally she calls one of them on it and he's like, look, you did what was possible, but objectively now is not the time for writing novel. You wrote about what is this in the end except a story of bourgeois social climbing. And she's like, oh God, is that true? And I I read that when I was in Italy um, promoting The Idiot. And it was at this moment when um, the far right, Matteo Salvini had just become minister of, I forget what, the interior or something like that. And they were sending away refugee ships and people were talking about it was the end of Europe. And so it was a little bit similar to actually promoting the idiot in the early Trump period was like yeah. promoting the idiot in Italian at this like so this weird Salvini moment. So it was like a little bit of the same questions. And I, I did encounter that um that story with the with the newspaper um in Italy also. And it just made me realize that when I saw that how Elena's story about Nino was taken as being not political, it really made me understand the extent to which my feeling that the political didn't apply to me was because so much of the political, the way that I encountered it in my youth was misogynistic for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. It was partly also a reason I called the book either or it's, it was kind of like there was a division between my parents where my father was the political one and my mother was the more artistic or more Mm -hmm. one. And in the end I had to take, you know, I chose my mother's side in some way because there was something about the, poli- the left-wing Turkish politics, class-centered politics that mm-hmm. left it, that my dad came from that really did not take women seriously. And the books that they read were like, you know, they're like, why don't you read Yashar Kemal? But there's like, there's no women in Yashar Kemal. Because when someone's sort of being critical of something that you wrote, like if someone's like, oh, the idiot isn't political or whatever, my instinct is to be like, oh, are they right? Um but when it when I saw it so clearly in the Ferrante book, I was like, no, those critics were not right. That story was critical. And then that made it possible to extrapolate it to my case. And that gave me impetus to write either or. Yeah. I mean, part of why I asked you to tell that story beyond the fact that I love the the sort of points of connection is when we first meet Celine in The Idiot, and this is partially her mom, but, you know, she says point blank, she's like, well, I want to know what books really mean. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I love the idea and I love the idea that she's talking about books with her mom and, you know, they're picking stuff apart and and sort of pushing each other to think in different directions. But this idea that we can ever know what a book is really supposed to mean, it's like we're every single one of us is going to bring our own experience and our own understanding. And in some cases, even our own desire, our own infatuation, right, to whatever. All cases, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I fall in love with ideas all the time and sometimes the execution isn't there and I'm like, oh, 
man, it happens. Or, you know, you start treating fictional characters like they're, you know, just standing down the street from you. And I know that sounds weird, but I'm a bookseller and that's part of the job, right? Like if a writer has done the thing, it's like, oh yeah, I really don't want to leave this behind. So the idea of going back to college, you know, with Celine and her gang and her friend Svetlana, who I really quite like as well, you know, the idea that they're sort of finding out what the definition of friendship is for them. And Celine is trying to still use classic literature to sort of help guide her through the 20th century is, um, yeah. it's, it's really charming. It's charming. It's absurdist. She's just a wonderful, messy character. And this idea that she really just wants to know what books mean and how she can apply it. And I just, it's great. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I mean, I think a lot of us go to college, like wanting to know what books really mean. Like, what does it really mean? I, I guess I was also thinking to some extent about the, and this is after having the exp experience of doing the PhD and being a teaching assistant yep. and teaching undergrads. And then, you know, teaching undergrads later after I finished, like how much of teaching literature is creating frustration in the students by like not <laughs> what they think is important and kind of withholding and, and being Socratic and being like, well, what do you think? And that's how we're trained to do it. And that feels mm -hmm. like a good way, but you know, maybe it's not. I wanted to, I, I was used to thinking of it from the teacher's perspective and I wanted to go get to go back and think of it from the perspective of the, of the kid in that moment. So that was a fun part of it. And, and also just to quickly say that Sidon is, she's really looking for an instruction manual. Like yeah. she's looking for, and that's why, um, I don't know. So right at the beginning, there's a mention of her trying to put in a tampon and reading like the instructions for how to put right. in a tampon and being like, the whole idea that you can read instructions and follow them, it's kind of crazy because it's assuming that you could replicate someone else's experience. Or like at the end, she works for a travel guidebook. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> if I you know, went on this thing and got lost, then does that mean if I write it down, but like that, that guy's not going to be sitting at the side. Of, she's really questioning the idea of instructions in a way that seems kind of comical, but I think it's actually kind of true. Like I think it it's not misplaced to think about how instruction works and how teaching works and what are the assumptions that we make that might not be true. And you can layer in authority. Yes, yes. Exactly. Right? Like yeah. there is an inference of authority when you're giving yeah. directions, you're giving instructions, you're you're showing teaching, whatever. It's there is there is a little bit of like, well, I'm gonna muddle my way through. I'm Mm -hmm. This will be no surprise to anyone. I'm not great at reading instructions sometimes. Can we go back to Celine and Svetlana for two seconds? Because you mm -hmm. ask a really great question over the course of their friendship. And you may actually come out and say this directly. Can you ever really be sincere without being pretentious? Oh, yeah. I love that they talk about all of those things. That was right? like, it was, yeah, it was really fun to write their conversations. I guess I think that a lot of things are sort of a continuum and there's no, it's like, it's again, the thing with the instructions. Like mm -hmm. if you go too far in this direction, you're going to be like insincere. And if you go too far in that direction, you're going mm -hmm. to be conscious and you have to kind of like, it's just like tuning. And I feel at this point, it's like another thing with references, like someone, uh, one question that I've gotten from readers is like, um, do you ever feel worried about putting in so many particular references, like to particular things, like that people won't be able to understand it? And I also feel like that's another, you know, you could write in a really spare kind of fabulistic allegorical way that's universal. And then like, everyone's going to be able to relate to it. Or at the other end, you have so many little details and illusions that the only person who would understand it is like you, because you were the only one who were there to like read all, who read all those particular things and heard mm -hmm. those things and was there at that time. And I think you have to tune it somewhere. And I'm sort of more comfortable tuning it towards the more pretentious end. And I'm more comfortable tuning it toward the more, um, the end of like more illusions. And I think that just means being okay with the idea that like the downside is some people are not going to get your illusions and they're going to feel alienated or upset. But the downside of like, uh, of the other thing is that uh, of writing in this kind of pure spare allegorical style is that mm -hmm going to tune out because there isn't that enough stuff to like kind of like hang your interest on and I guess it's just a matter of, of taste well I mean the thing is I've read a lot of the other novels that you talk about have I studied them I have not I have read them but like I'm not going to run out and read Andre Breton now and Nadja <laughs> no offense like, I know I'm not going to connect with that, but yeah. I have other, like, I don't feel like I'm missing anything because that's a point of reference that I don't specifically have experience with. Like, I have enough experience of the Russians. I have enough experience of Flaubert and Balzac. And, you know, I mean, this is a conversation I had actually with, um, with one of the editors at the New Yorker where mm -hmm. I was 
writing an essay that mentioned a lot of Russian literature, and they really wanted um, at the because it's a general interest magazine, and the right. kind of like anytime you mention anything, like uh, and I had said, you know, I went to Ukraine for the first time in 2019, and as the author of two books with titles "The Idiot" and "The Possessed," I got to hear a certain amount about people's opinions about Dostoevsky, and right. that's the sentence, and it sounds a certain way. And it comes back from editing and it's like books called The Possessed and the Idiot, titles of books by Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky, who was born in this year and da da da, da. Right, right. Like You have to realize that not everyone knows these things. And it's like, I totally realize that not everyone knows these things. And it's also not that I know everything. I know a lot about a very small specialized area. I don't know a lot about everything. And I, the way I feel when I, I enjoy reading things where everything isn't explained and it doesn't feel like a Wikipedia right. article, especially now that there's the internet. I feel like if I didn't get something, I could look it up. And then with the Breton and the, that was actually, um, it's funny because there was like a micro moment when that book was on every cool person's bookshelf and it really did not last very long. And I remember, oh, no, it didn't. I remember doing like, <laughs> who were even just like a little bit younger than me who were like, why is she reading this dreadful book? And I'm like, you don't understand, like everyone has, but yeah, so that's why that's there. And I, I did put a, a decent amount of effort into um, for me, the story isn't, it's not about like knowing who Breton was and the, the context. It's about understanding like what it meant with it, what its cultural currency was in that mm-hmm. world. What, you know, what did it mean to see that book cover on Svetlana's bookshelf? And what did it mean to see those photos and that kind of, and I feel like I, my hope is that you can understand that even if you haven't read the particular book. Completely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I love about both The Idiot and Either Or is that they're not exact. I don't need them to be exactly my experience. I need to be involved in Celine's life and her friends' lives. And I'm more interested in the world that you build in both of these books. And they sit really nicely together. I, you know, you could argue actually that you don't have to read The Idiot before you read either or. It's a, it's a rich experience if you choose to do that, but they really do stand Oh, thank you for saying that. That was yeah. a question was that I wanted them to be able to. Yeah, yeah, they super stand on their own. You know, I know there are autobiographical elements, obviously. You've talked about it. You know, you've been very open about it since the beginning. They're just fun. I just, I want to be in the world. I want to hang out. Like, I, you and I don't exactly correspond in the years that we were in school. But like that whole, like all of the emotions, right? All of the, you know, stuff that you've read or not read or just that entire emotional landscape it's really kind of great to be thrown back into that and just be like well at least I have some distance (laughs) at least it's not yesterday well yeah that's the hope is that you know because like why why are novels full of all these specific details and also you know I get a fair number of reader mail from people who are that age now yeah they t- the letters tend to, to look a little bit similar and they're like, you're not going to believe what just happened. I was sitting reading your book in this cafe and this song came on the radio and then I was reading this book and then someone mentioned right. something, and just the other day someone been saying that. And it's like, I think that the, for me, the ideal of putting, um, first of all, the point of writing about myself is not because I'm so interesting, but because it's what I know and it's mm-hmm. because I want to write about the human condition and really get in there with the details and the motivations. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't want to lie. I don't want to fudge things. I feel right. like there's bad information out there. And, and then the reason for going to all the detail is like, you could say, like, you could just say what the upshot is of like a lot of novels, like, you know, in search of lost time is like um, social climbing and snobism is a waste of time. It's more important to do things that are actually meaningful to you. And you could say that. And like, you know, maybe a person would mean something, but not really. But if you like tell the whole story of like, I was so excited to go to this party and like having the granularity, even when it's not, I mean, by definition, it's not going to be transferable to all people who are, you know, different people and different ages and live in different places and, and everything. But I think once there's a certain amount of granularity, it invites the person to go back and reconstruct that, you know, what was the that for them in their mind and gives them a structure to hang all of the things on. Like, because otherwise, why do you need a whole story about some random person and like all of their stuff? It's because you can't just transmit like the moral to people. It has to, you have to, like, there's a, or, I mean, you can, that's a different kind of book. But the point of the novel is that there's a, you know, storytelling can deliver certain things that can't be said about it. So I also heard there's a novella coming. Emma Klein does this cool thing with Gagosian. And my understanding is you're doing something for that with Celine. Yeah. 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 It's, um, 
So it's set the year after her graduation. Um, so she's moved to California to mm-hmm. go to school and she's taken a year off to try to write a novel. And the thing she really wants to write about is everything that happens with that happened in her first year of college with Yvonne. Now she, she has another boyfriend and she's living with him, but for some reason she's still writing about Yvonne, which makes her feel really guilty. And she's like, why can't I be happy in my happy relationship? Right. And then on top of that, she feels like, well, this thing that happened to me is too trivial and a historical to be a novel. And she reads Austerlitz by Zabald and Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Haruki Murakami. <laughs> and she's like, oh, these are both books about a mysterious, elusive person where the mystery of that person is really tied to like a genocidal event that happened related to World War II in the mm-hmm. geographic area where it took place. So she's like, oh, what genocidal event? So she ends up writing a book about like, it's called Tituba. And it's about the Salem witch trials, which kind right. of happened in the geographic area. So she she writes a book about the Salem witch trials, basically, and the role of this like enslaved indigenous woman in them, which is a its own true kind of appalling story. Yep. Uh, and then at the end of it, she's like, "Wait, what?" And then she goes back to school. So that's yeah. Can I ask who the artist that they're pairing you with? Because that's the whole point of the oh, series. Yeah. That- it's an artist and a writer. And I just, I really like this idea. I think it's really cool. It's brilliant, right? I'm so excited about it. I don't know. I, um, we just finished the edits on the text and they're still looking. Well, we can be patient, but I, I just, I think it's a really cool idea. And I like the idea too, of switching to a shorter story for a second, because I mean, I know people have asked you, so we get a a book for each year of college and it doesn't sound like that's what your plan is, but Um, are you writing the book about Celine in her thirties? Cause that I would really like to read. I really want to get to it. I really want to get to it. I really enjoyed doing this shorter form with Tituba. So I think yeah. I have like a few kind of shorter installments in mm-hmm. her life that are going to like, so I think the next novel is going to be made up of, you know, like a few different parts that are different episodes, different episodes in her life that are going to extend over more mm-hmm. time because I just, I, a, I don't have time to write another book for every year of college. You know, I'll right. die old age when she's bought her first, you know, Ikea futon. And, <laughs> <laughs> and B, it's also like, you know, those first first years of college, so much happens. And then I think even in your memory, like time gets sort of condensed the older that you get. Like, Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah. I don't know. It feels like my first two years of college, like as much happened and I thought as much stuff as like maybe in like 10 years of life between the ages of. 30 and 40. And it just feels like it's getting faster. Like it's going to be what another 20 years or 40 curtains. I'm I'm glad that we got to this point. (laughs) Yeah. I also, I think she's just going to keep getting, I think Celine's just going to keep getting more interesting. I mean, I watching her sort of, I don't want to say flounder because that's not fair to her, but watching her figure it out yeah, I'm really fond of your character. I'm really, really fond of this woman. Oh, thank you. I want her to get to now because there's some, like, I feel like she sees things that I don't see. And Mm -hmm. so far that's been kind of a function of like, she's in the past and I'm writing about her now. So I guess I see the things, but like, I almost feel like if I could catch up to the present, then Mm -hmm. be able to see things through her point of view. I don't know that maybe that's like an unrealistic. It makes a ton of sense to me, but did Celine surprise you at all? I sort of feel like she did, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was surprising even. So when I I was 38 and I, Mm -hmm. I revisited that first draft that I wrote when I was 23 about being 18. And there was so much that I didn't remember. There's so much about, I don't know, like her sense of outrage about everything and how kind of funny she is. And that she made a a lot of kind of jokes that I wouldn't make anymore because they just seemed kind of too mean. And, and, you know, some of it I took out because it just did feel mean, but a lot of it I just still thought was really funny and unexpected. Mm -hmm. And something about, once I'd seen that and had that experience, I could kind of keep going in that voice, even though I wasn't that person anymore. And then with either or, it was a matter of kind of like updating it a little bit because there's, I wanted it to be like, there's things that she says in either or that she couldn't have said in The Idiot, but also I wanted mm-hmm. to like, you know, plausibly the same person, which is, it feels like one of the most interesting like jobs of novels is to portray the person over time and how yeah. the person changes, but they're like, they're the same person in some sense, but like, what is that sense exactly? It feels really kind of fruitful. I just, I really like the novel as an art form. I really do. I just, I think you have so much room to roam and you can do so many cool things with it. And the question is like, what do you want to do? I mean, yes. I mean, it is the ultimate sort of 
form for capturing any passage of time, right? Like whether it's specifically about a person or a community or whatever. And you for a second had talked about not writing fiction anymore before either or came out. And I just want to make sure that that's not the case anymore, right? Like, we're good. You're staying with fiction for a while, right? Yeah, for now, we're good. Yeah, I did go through a moment where I was like, I've been depoliticized. I've been de-radicalized by novels. And I I learned to aestheticize the conditions of my oppression rather than to question them and to change them in the world. And I guess now I've both come around to both to the idea of like, even if you just decide I'm going to actually change the conditions in the world instead of aestheticizing them, like, how do you do that? That's not really clear. And I guess I, you know, from writing either or, like the most gratifying thing has been meeting younger readers who actually are activists and who say that they've been inspired by it to actually do things in, in the world. And I now think that there's a lot more room in the novel for it to be critical than I feared at that moment when I felt panicked right. and like de-radicalized. And also that there's like, it's important to have people in the world who are like acting, 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 but it's important, you know, society sort of um, discourages people from like removing themselves from the flow of life and like sitting in a room and just thinking about what everything means. And it's important work. It takes a lot of time. You can't like speed it up. Mm -hmm. I believe increasingly, or I believe again, that it has value in guiding how we're going to move. It's you need people to sort of remove themselves and, and analyze things. And those are the skills that I've developed. So that's what I'm going to do for now. You also sound hopeful. I am. I am hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. It's yeah. really, really cool to hear. That sounds like a really good place to wrap though. And thank you so much, Elif. It was so great to talk to you. The Idiot is out now in paperback. Either or is out in paperback. You can also get them in very cool audiobooks with Elif reading them. And those I super recommend. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Miwa. This has been an utter delight. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.